Hi guys, welcome back. In this video we talk about rearrangement of series. Um, I'm going to show you, show you an example that's it's right out of our textbook. Um, it's, it's pretty much in all the textbooks because it's so, it's, so, it's just elegant. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, so here are a couple of facts. And this kind of blew my mind the first time I heard it. It says, um, here, here are the facts. A conditionally convergent series can be rearranged. So like we can change the order that we're adding things um, and it can be rearranged in such a way to give us any sum. And the fact that it's any sum, like that's pretty powerful. Like any finite or any finite number, any real number you want, we can rearrange a series and make that, that series equal that sum. That's called Riemann's rearrangement theorem. I'm not gonna prove it, but um, it turns out that it's true. That only works for conditionally convergent series. Now remember, conditionally convergent series are series whose absolute value does not converge, but the original series does converge, the absolute value series. Um, now absolute value, or absolutely convergent series, so those are series whose absolute values series converge, and the original series also converges. Let me actually write this down. Saying it out loud is probably not as helpful as seeing it. A conditionally convergent series, that's one where this series diverges, the series of absolute values diverges, but the original series converges. That's conditional convergence. And for absolutely convergent series, both of those converge. This converge, uh, this converges, and the or other one converges. Um, so we're talking about conditionally convergent and absolutely convergent series. So conditionally convergent series, that's one where you can't take its absolute value series um, and get it to converge. But the original series, because of the negatives and positives somehow, the negative signs, the negative terms cancel with the positive terms in such a way that all of them add together to give you some number. Um, but if you were to take the absolute value of all those terms, uh, it diverges. That's conditional convergence. Absolutely convergent series are series who converge when they have positive and negative terms, and then when you take the absolute value, they still converge. Um, so so that's, that's what those two things are. Now let's talk about this rearrangement again. A conditionally convergent series can be rearranged to give us any sum we want, and I think that that is really cool. Um, absolutely convergent series um, can be rearranged, but no matter how you rearrange them, you're going to get the same sum every time. And this means that addition um, is different when you're talking about infinitely many terms. We know, just using real numbers, a plus b is the same as b plus a. So I can change the order on that. Um, I can also regroup things. If I've got a plus b plus c, I could do a plus b and then add c, or I could do b plus c and then add a, or do a time or plus the quantity b plus c. These are the properties of associativity and or commutivity and associativity um, for real numbers. These rules don't exactly apply when you have infinitely many terms. That's why we needed to define the sum of a series in terms of um, sequences of partial sums. When you have a finite number of um, terms and then you say, okay, well what happens to that sum as n goes to infinity? That's how we had to define this special case of addition with infinitely many terms. Um, so, so this is really different. Um, if we have infinitely many terms and a conditionally convergent series, we can rearrange the terms and we can get a different value. Um, so let's look at this one. Um, this is a conditionally convergent series. Um, when n equals 1, that's negative 1 to the 1 plus 1, so negative 1 squared is positive 1 over 1. When n equals 2, we get negative 1 over 2. When n equals 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, so that's going to be a positive 1 in the numerator over 3. So the denominator is just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on, 6, so on. And in the numerator, we're alternating. It's positive, 
negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on, forever. Um, so that is our a particular alternating series. Now notice, if I take the absolute value of that, well then I'm just looking at the harmonic series. So that's just 1 over n. And we know, because we've done the integral test, that this series diverges. It diverges to infinity. Um, we replace n with x, we integrate from 1 to infinity, we get natural log of the absolute value of x, we substitute in b, we substitute in 1 and subtract, and then we take the limit as b goes to infinity. We get natural log of b, that's the sum, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's not growing very quickly, but it's growing. Um, so this slowly goes to infinity as we take more and more terms. Um, so this is called the harmonic series again. It's a p-series with p equals 1. If you remembered that it diverged because p equals 1, that's great too. Um, when p equals 1, if p equals 1 for a p-series, and of course p equals 1 is less than or equal to 1, that p-series diverges. So this series is not absolutely convergent. Sometimes people will call this series up here the alternating harmonic series. So we've got 1 minus 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth and so on. So it's just like the harmonic series but some of them are negative now, half of the terms are negative. Um, it turns out that this one converges by the alternating series test. So let's just prove it to ourselves. Alternating series test, we identify b. It's absolute value of a sub n, so it's just 1 over n. Of course, as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0. We know that. And if we look at b sub n plus 1, and we compare it to b sub n, 1 over n plus 1 is definitely less than 1 over n for all n. The denominator is larger, so the fraction is smaller. So this alternating harmonic series does converge. By the alternating series test. Okay, um, so that means if the series of absolute values is harmonic and it diverges, but the actual series itself converges, that means this series is called conditionally convergent. Now this next part I'm not going to prove to you, I'm just going to state it, and then we're going to use this fact. Okay, so it's a fact that this series, this alternating harmonic series, converges to natural log of 2. And you might even say, it's a fact that this converges to anything, because we can rearrange the series and make it converge to anything we want. As it's written right now with the, the current um, order of the terms, the series converges to natural log of 2. Now the order matters because we're taking the limit of, of the nth partial sum and then seeing what we get as n goes to infinity. Um, because that's technically what we're doing every time we determine whether a series converges or diverges. This technically only goes to one value, it's natural log of 2. But watch this. I can expand this and rearrange the terms, and I, I, if it converges to natural log of 2, it turns out that we can prove that it converges to half of natural log of 2. This is in your textbook. 
I just wanted to show you because I think it's cool. And just talk about it with you a little bit. Okay, so that is what it looks like in expanded form. Now let's rearrange it just a little bit. Yeah, so I want to grab the first two terms and actually simplify that. And then I want to look at um, a couple of other terms and simplify those. Uh, the one-third and the one-sixth. So here's my rearrangement. I'll take the one minus one-half from right there. I'll put that there. And then I'll put the negative one-fourth here. So now all three of these guys are taken care of. They're already on my list. Now I want to look at the one-third minus one-sixth. So I'm putting those together and I'm going to subtract those. And then I'll take this negative one-eighth from over here. And actually there's going to be a one-ninth and a minus one-tenth and so on. Next I want to take the one-fifth and the negative one-tenth and add those together. And then subtract one-twelfth. It's a little bit difficult to see what this pattern is, like how we're doing this rearranging, doing this rearranging. Um, but I've got the one half, one minus one half, and the negative one fourth, the one third, and the negative one sixth, and the one eighth, negative one eighth. Then we've got um, one over five and one, or negative one over ten, and the minus one over twelve. The next one will be. Um, positive 1 over 7 and minus uh, 1 over 14 and so on. Say, what are you doing? How are you doing this? Okay. I know it's sort of going off the page and it's going down. Okay, now let's simplify this. 1 minus 1 half is just 1 half. So I've got one half minus one fourth now. And if I get a common denominator here, I've got two sixths minus one sixth is positive one sixth minus one eighth. And if I get a common denominator here, I've got two tenths minus one tenth, that's positive one tenth minus one twelfth. And then here, if I get a common denominator, I've got 2 over 14 minus 1 over 14. That's positive 1 over 14. Do you see what's happening? Those were all terms on my list. I just took a rearrangement. You might say you skip some terms. Well, those terms are going to be used later. Don't worry about it. Those are coming up um, later down in our, our rearranged series. Now, if I take this and I factor out a 1 half, I have 1 minus 1 half plus 1 third minus 1 fourth plus 1 fifth minus 1 sixth plus 1 seventh and so on. Watch this. That was the original series. And we said earlier that that converges to natural log of 2. We haven't proven that, but I just told you it was a fact that this converges to natural log of 2 in its original arrangement. So after I've rearranged it a little bit, and factored out the one half, it turns out I get the original series times one half. So I get one half times natural log of two. I'm like, what? Does that mean natural log of two equals one half natural log of two? Absolutely not. It does not. But it just means that this infinite addition that we've been talking about, this this idea of taking infinitely many positive numbers and then adding them together, it's different. It doesn't work exactly like regular addition. I can't just change the order or change the grouping or both. So that's associativity and commutativity. Like I can't just do that with these numbers on this list for infinitely many of them and expect them to work like regular real number arithmetic. Um, 
this infinite addition or infinite subtraction is very different. Um, and it's all based on taking a sequence of partial sums, that's a finite number of terms with just regular addition, and then taking its limit as n goes to infinity. So as soon as you change that order up for conditionally convergent series, turns out you can get a different value. Um, and I just showed you how this gave you natural log of two in one case, and then half of natural log of two in another case. But Riemann's rearrangement theorem is more, pow more powerful than that. It says, you have a conditionally convergent series, you can arrange that so that it gives you any sum, any sum you want. You want that to equal 100? We can rearrange it to make it equal 100. You want that equal negative 20? We can rearrange it to make it equal negative 20. You want it to equal zero? We can do that too. Um, so I think that's just pretty cool, it's fun. Um, absolutely convergent series, no matter how you rearrange them, you're always going to get the same value. Um, so it's, this is just an aside. Um, with this rearrangement of series, you see that infinite addition is not the same as finite addition. Finite addition follows some nice rules, has some nice properties. And again, those are called commutativity. That means you can um, add in any order you want. And associativity, which means you can add, um, you, you can group in any way that you want. So you can group these two guys or these two guys either way you're going to get the same answer.